So, E. Schott Schneider, who again we quoted for interest groups and we're quoting him again for parties, say that political parties made modern democracy and democracy is unthinkable without them. And he's saying this for a reason. Um, in particular, he's talking about the fact that parties do something in terms of organization for democracy that no other group does. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. How many of you have one issue, or maybe two issues, that you care about? Raise your hand. Look at that already. Your head is the last class. There were three people who named an issue that they cared about. So um, if you were to join an interest group, for example, we talked about that last time. We had lots of different examples of types of interest groups you might join. Right? Some of them for mental health, some of them for education, some of them for the environment, some of them for gun rights, some of them are pro-life or pro-choice, right? These are all interest groups. ACLU, okay? Or maybe a professional group. How many of you want to join a profession when you graduate? One, 17 of you, that's a little low, right? So. Um, I would hope that most of you would move on into some sort of professional sphere, right? When we talk about this, we're talking about your interests, right? But those are diverse, and they're, I just named several issues. Um, those are not parties. Political parties are groups that present candidates in elections under a common label, right? And they're created for the purpose of winning and governing winning and governing once they are in office. They run the elections, okay? In each state, parties run the elections. If you're concerned about the fact that the party, how many of you took the ideology or I signed with quiz and you ended up with a party that was not Democrats or Republicans? Raise your hand. Huh, that's a pretty big group, right? And those of you who are paying attention enough to Raise your hands, that looks like about a third, right? That's a lot. And yet, you're given essentially two choices at elections. Because of the way that parties run elections in states. They're also gatekeepers to a certain extent over who their uh, candidates are gonna be. Uh, but they don't do a great job of it in the United States. In other countries, they do a better job of it. Uh, use mine, it's here. That's not true. So we go. Right. Um, in other democracies, right, you have to pay dues to join a party. And then you have a vote in who the candidates are that will be put forth. Do you have to pay dues to be a Democrat or a Republican or a Libertarian or a Green Party member in the United States? What's the answer? No. No, you don't. Right? You do not have to pay dues. You just register and that's what you are. Which is also important because you are what you say you are. You're self-selected. Okay? Candidates in the United States are selected in primary elections. Two major parties get automatic ballot access in every single state. There are a few states where it's a little bit more open. Oklahoma has the most restrictive ballot access in the nation. 
In order to get onto it, you have to get a number of signatures saying the Libertarian Party, for example, should be on the ballot. And then you have to win a percentage of the vote big enough that you're automatically on it next time. And if you don't get enough that time, 5%, 10%, then you're off. Okay? So you can't even, even if you've sustained it for, sustained it for two parties, for two election cycles, it's not enough. <laughs> you have to keep getting the vote. The other issue with this, because candidates are self-selected, sometimes picked by activist groups to go ahead. Then the party makeup, you know, the ideological parts of the party, they're not picking the candidates. Okay, people are choosing for themselves. In Oklahoma, for example, right now, we have an example of this, right? Who is the governor of the state of Oklahoma? Kevin Stitt. Kevin Stitt is the governor, right? Who is the secretary of education in the state of Oklahoma? No. Secretary of State of Education. Uh, sec uh, secretary of Education. I mean, super, superintendent. Superintendent of Education, sorry. Joy Hoffmeister. Joy Hoffmeister. Right? Joy Hoffmeister ran and won as a Republican or Democrat? Republican. Is Joy Hoffmeister still a Republican? She is not. She said, I have looked at Governor Stitt's policies as far as education are concerned. I don't agree with him. So I'm a Democrat now. Okay? I'm a Democrat. And so she's running for governor as a Democrat. She chose that. Did the Democratic Party in the state of Oklahoma recruit her to be a candidate for governor? They did not. Right? She chose herself. Another uh, access to this is that another thing that comes out of this is that it's porous, so it's subject to outside movements, moving it either to the left or to the right, like the Tea Party. Does anybody in this class know what the Tea Party movement was? Yes. Um, they were uh, right wing movements um, that were very against, um, well, they were very for limited government, right? Very for limited government, um, okay. But they were also socially conservative as opposed to the Libertarian Party, which can be socially neutral to. Okay, so somewhat, somewhat libertarian, but incredibly socially conservative, right? In other words, very traditional and very anti-diversity. I think that would be fair. Okay? So the Tea Party movement kind of pushes into the Republican Party. I'll see a lot of Republicans who had been in office because they were not Republican enough. And so they were called what? Anybody know? Rhinos. Rhinos. Yes, rhinos. Eric, you can answer. You can other people. Rhinos. Okay. <laughs> And so rhinos means what? Republican in name only. Okay? They're saying even though this person is conservative and is voting the same way that Republicans vote, we're going to call them rhinos and we're going to oust them out of office because they are not libertarian enough. What's a libertarian philosophy? Um, Okay, so a true libertarian perspective, right, is going to be less government in all spheres, right? Less government in terms of regulation of business, but also less government in terms of regulation of morality in society, okay? And so we see part of that, so we have this less regulation, but a conservative standpoint is less regulation, but what goes with it? Moralism. Moral conservatism, right? So the Tea Party pushed against the Republican Party saying that they were not that enough. So they pushed it farther to the right, more extreme. Also out of this poorest movement, you get the election of President Donald Trump. In 2016, how is Trump elected as a Republican? 
understand, he was a Democrat 12 years before. So how did Donald Trump get elected as a Republican in 2016? Okay, Tea Party philosophy to the forefront, but with that, he throws in some other stuff. He ran as a populist. And he ran as a populist, okay? Which means he appeals to what? What do populists appeal to, guys? The mass, uh, you know, uh, charismatic leadership. Mass, charismatic leadership. Do you need to be particularly knowledgeable? No, you're going to appeal more to what do populist leaders appeal to? Emotion. Emotion, right? Like demagogues, right? And so in particular, Donald Trump is going to use fear, right? Fear of what? Fear of change, but fear that we change too much, maybe at that point. Fear of what else? Immigrants, absolutely, right? That's the big one. Fear that the United States is not what the United States is supposed to be, right? I mean, that's a slogan, make America great again. This is populism, right? This is appealing to base instincts, not ideology. And he throws out a lot of things he says he's gonna do as a Republican. For example, build infrastructure, something that's very popularly positive, uh, bring back manufacturing jobs, right? Plus, build a wall and keep people out who are stealing what? Our jobs. And what else are they doing? Uh, crime. Crime. I love the rapists, right? Murderers, right? And some of them are good people, I suppose, right? This is a quote, direct quote. Okay? He's running on this, and he's running in a Republican field in 2016 that is very big or very small. It's huge, right? And the way that the Republican primary setup is set up is you don't have to win the most votes to get the primary. What do you have to win? Or you don't have to win a majority. You just have to win. You don't know. You just have to win the most votes out of 20 people to get all the electoral votes. Think about that. Right? So if there's 20 people and you get 22% and you have more than everybody else, you get them all. Right? That's a big deal. The Republican Party, because it's so porous, the Democratic Party is porous as well. Okay? But not quite as porous as the Republican Party. But the Democratic Party in the last two presidential cycles had who as a top two contender? She was 2016, but two, 2016 and 2020. Who was the top two contender both times? Bernie. Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders registered as a Democrat. Actually, yes, independent, but he would call himself a socialist. A democratic socialist, right? He's not even registered as a Democrat, and he almost won the Democratic primary twice. Okay? This is how poor they are. And he also populist, right? He's also populist, less anti-diversity, um, but big fear of loss of manufacturing jobs, okay? Very much um, anti-corporate America, populist. There's three ways to understand American political parties. I always ask this in a multiple choice question on the exam. Always. Sometimes I get specific. And I say, for example, how is party organized? It's organized at the local level, so county level, Cleveland County Democrats, the Oklahoma Republican Convention, the Democratic National Convention. So local level, state level, federal level, okay? And then party and government. So these are the people who have been elected to office who claim to be a Democrat or a Republican or a Libertarian or whatever they claim to be, right? I claim to be this thing, okay? So right now, if you're talking about the Republican Party, 
Are there any, I'm going to ask you guys an important word here because in my last class, they did not know the meaning of this word. So I'm testing you guys. Are you ready? Is there a schism in the Republican Party? Yes. Yeah. And what's a schism? A breaking away. A breaking away. Very good. Okay. My last class looked at me like I was crazy. So you guys know this word because you're my 1230 class and more awake and smarter, right? They don't tell them. Okay. But my point is there's a schism in the Republican Party. What's going on? Sort of Okay, so Jeb Bush, Mitch McConnell, Liz Cheney, right? Mitt Romney, right? Are going to be, they're all conservative Republicans. Ideologically, they vote like Republicans, and they always have. But they're being called rhinos. rhinos. Republicans in name only, even though they are Republicans, very clearly. But the Trump schism is saying, or the Trump faction, in this schism, right? They're saying what? They're not what? Conservative enough. What does that mean? It's interesting. They're too moderate to compromise too much. And I think they're not the type of conservative that <coughs> Okay, I think, and I think the last part is the key. Not the type of conservative that Trump is. And they voted to certify the election results. That's the and they voted to certify the election. They, you know, said, oh, this is a democratic election, and so we're going to vote to certify it. So therefore, they must be not true Republicans. I want you to think about that, because that's saying that the party is more important than democracy. That's the claim, right? That's significant. Now, is there also a schism? So if we look at these leaders, Former President Trump and Senator McConnell, I would say Mitch McConnell is definitely on one side and Trump is on the other side, right? I would say Mitch McConnell is as conservative as they come, all right? He's no Lisa Murkowski, right? Who could at least be called a moderate. Mitch McConnell could not be called a moderate. But this exists and there's this tension. In the Democratic Party, the two primary leaders are Biden and Speaker Pelosi, right? President Biden, Speaker Pelosi. Do we see an open animosity between these two people? No. Now, is there a wing of the Democratic Party that is more progressive? Absolutely. And so who do we see there in that wing? <laughs> okay, so, and Cory Booker, eh, you know, he's pretty moderate, but, yes, AOC, absolutely, the squad, absolutely, Bernie Sanders, absolutely, right, uh, Elizabeth Warren, absolutely, okay, but they're still not breaking in the same way, instead they're doing what? They work within the system, they work within the Democrats. Now, now I want you guys to think about this, because it's important, okay? Because the Democratic Party is united, and the Republican Party is not. And this is the first time this has happened in about, you know, it started, like, it started happening a few years ago, but this is the first time it's happened in about 60 years, where you could say that the Democrats were more united than the Republicans. Okay, and part of it is this group that President Trump brings with him, the party and the electorate, right? These are people who identify in the electorate with a party. How many of you, just raise your hand, if you would say you identify with a political party? Raise your hand. Right? Ish, kind of, right? I would say about half of you, right, would say that. That's pretty standard. It's usually, it's about two thirds of the population is gonna say, I identify with Democrats or Republicans, right? And the third is gonna say, independent, or I feel like more libertarian or constitutional or something like that, okay? But here's the key. 
it's really different. I talk to you guys about your interests. Some of you may identify, who's someone who would say that they identify with one of the political parties based on one or two issues? Several of you, right? Okay. This is not unusual, and as a matter of fact, it's more typical because we don't get informed about all of the issues. Am I informed about all of the issues? I mean, almost, because it's my job and I like it. Do I expect all of you to be informed about all of the issues? No. And this is why parties matter in democracy, because we use them as shortcuts. Okay? There are two or three issues that you really care about, and they line up with the Republican Party, or they line up with the Democratic Party. And so you use it as a shortcut to make a decision. Does that make you lazy? What do you think? Do you guys feel lazy about doing that? I'm not calling you lazy. I'm honestly saying, hey, look, you've got a lot of stuff going on, right? Don Mallett's who is a professor of political theory here at the University of Oklahoma, many years ago was asked by the student newspaper, back whenever you got a student newspaper every day, he was asked, hey, why don't students vote more? And he said, well, you know, they're young. This is a time to figure out who they are, fall in love, things that are a little bit more important. Right? And so what I'm saying to you is, I don't expect you, no one expects you, or even when you're an adult really, to know everything. But to understand enough to be able to find the answers you want to find, that's the purpose of this class, right? So that you can be informed enough to make a decision that makes sense for democracy. So realignment's We've had the same two political parties since 1860, okay? But they have not stood for the same things over time, okay? That's important. 1860 is whenever we have the beginning of the Republicans. They form out of um, an abolitionist group and what's left of the Whigs. What do you guys know about Whigs? I think, yeah. They did hate Jackson. Um, so, Whigs mainly are, you know, very business centric, okay? They're very business centric, they're very conservative, right? Uh, the Democratic Republicans under Jefferson become just the Democrats under Jackson, okay? And they're very much about local power, state power, power of individuals to make decisions, elect everything, small d democracy. Okay? The Whigs are saying, oh, no. Maybe there's some things that we should appoint. Maybe there's too much corruption in that. Okay? But the Whigs are fading rapidly until they join with the Republicans who are seeking abolition of slavery. So in 1860, what happens? Well, somebody's elected first. Abraham Lincoln is elected as Republican president of the United States. This is significant, okay? The election of Lincoln is a critical election. With the election of Lincoln, you see the solid South, right? Look to the election results and suddenly become very concerned that the majority of people favor ending slavery. Okay? They see this as a threat to what? What's it a threat to? It's a threat to lots of things. What's it a threat to? Business, right? Money. It's a big one. What else? Say it again. The way of life and social Way of life and social structures, specifically, you can say it. White supremacy, right? They see it as an end. And so the South secedes to do what? Form their own country and preserve slavery, right? 
1860 is a critical election. It's a signal of change in ideological bent. Usually it takes one or more elections that we see, but I'm going to show you two really key ones. In 1800, you guys don't really have to remember that one, but it's the one where the Federalists disappear. Okay, remember the Federalists, the Anti-Federalists that we talked about earlier? Federalists disappear in 1800. Jefferson's Democratic Republicans win, and they continue to win that party in its in for 60 years. Okay? They become the Democrats, then there's the Republicans. The Republicans win in 1860. It's a civil war realignment. What you have is you have shopkeepers, you have workers, laborers, who all moved to the Republican Party from the Democratic Party in 1860 under the idea of ending slavery. Okay? The shift of a particular group. In 1932, we have another realignment. Can you guess what this was called? One's called the Civil War Realignment. 1932 is called the the New Deal realignment or the Great Depression realignment, right? Okay, so the Great Depression is going on. It's known as the New Deal realignment, okay? And who's elected in 1932? FDR. FDR, the greatest president of all time. I will spend much time speaking of him, okay? And you can't say that he's not the greatest president of all time because he was elected four times. But we cut that off after him. Yeah, because you were jealous. <laughs> FDR wields more power, changes the presidency completely, and gets what he wants, which you cannot say about other presidents, no. in terms of just ranking the ability of a president to shape the nation, FDR wins. Okay? So, when we talk about this realignment in 1932, we see a shift again. Who is going to shift to the Democrats in 1932? <laughs> Yes, but not quite fully, right? Still hanging on to the party of Lincoln. <laughs> union workers. Union workers, or workers who would like to have a union, more specifically. Specifically, all those middle class laborers who moved in 1860 because they wanted to end slavery, move in 1932 because... Why? Because Hoover says, as a Republican president, says, hey, look, it'll get better. It's just a market. Right? And people are starving. And it's not that Hoover was necessarily wrong. It would have eventually gotten better. But FDR said, no, we can make it better. And so we see a wholesale change in people getting on to this idea of having a new deal. The government is actually working for you and changing things, right? In 1964 to 1994, we have what's known as a secular realignment. It's called secular because it happens over time, okay? It's not a, there's no real critical, there's some critical elections, 64 and 94, 30 years apart, being those critical elections. Right? Eric, they're visiting. So, when we talk about this election, or these series of elections, what happens? What happens in 1964 to cause a critical election? The Civil Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act. The Civil Rights Movement, generally. Because Democrats do what? What do Democrats do? They support it. Now, lots of Republicans did at the time too, okay, in 1964. And you have certainly that solid South Democrat who's not supporting it. But you start seeing people in the South voting Republican at the national level but they're continuing to vote Democrat at the local level, at the congressional level. Why? Why are they voting Republican nationally and voting Democrat locally in the South? It's 
That's a not easy answer, so I'll tell you, right? It's because there's absolutely no Republican infrastructure in the South. There are no local parties. I know you guys are like, what? What are you even saying to me? This doesn't make sense. It's still not compute. I've seen the map. There's no local infrastructure. New Gingrich builds it by hand in the 1980s. There's more traditional conservative infrastructure in the South. And you have a lot of blue dog Democrats during that period of time. What's a blue dog Democrat? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sort of, yeah. Well, tell me what you're thinking about. <laughs> I'll say yellow dog now. What's the yellow dog Democrat? I Well, a yellow dog Democrat is someone who would rather vote for a yellow dog than a Republican, right? And so, definitely true to party. But a blue dog Democrat, right, is someone who votes for the Democratic Party on issues of social issues, when we're talking about specifically the, well, actually, let's go back, votes for the Democratic Party in terms of infrastructure issues, the size of government, right? Social security programs, things like that, big government, but is going to vote with the Republican Party or against the Democratic Party when it comes to things like moral issues. Does that make sense? Okay, so more morally conservative, but big government. Who are our Democrats? Okay. So we have a secular realignment, 1994, <clears throat> you have the Republican Revolution. The Republicans take back the House for the first time in 60 years. Think about that. I mean, it's a big deal. They had the Senate now and then, but the House, no. They take back the House for the first time in that, long, that period of time. The secular realignment is because the South suddenly, over time, 30 years, moves from the Democratic Party at the local level to all elections. So, why do we even have a two-party system? We've talked about this, you guys. I, I asked you the question, right? How many of you were some other party besides Democrat or Republican when you did the ideology quiz? Right? That's quite a lot. So, why do we have a two-party system? Well, the rules of the game, the structure sets it up that way. In the United States, we follow a first-past-the-post rule, okay? So, let's say you have three candidates running. You don't have to get a majority to win. You just have to get the most votes. Okay? And over time, it becomes less and less viable for more than two parties to compete. And I have a video. Will you guys hit the lights back there? I have a video that will help show this, right? We also have, this is important. Okay. Um, if I can make my thing do what it's supposed to do. Really, it helps you. Welcome to the problem of first past the post voting explained by me, CGP Greg. The royal family has a problem, but this isn't just any royal family. These are the lions, rulers of the jungle since time immemorial. There are protests over the monarchy's absolute power, and the citizens of the animal kingdom want a say in how they are governed. Bending to the pressure, Lion has abdicated his crown, and King is to be an elected office. To ensure a smooth transition, and because she is craftier than her husband, the Queen Lioness is remaining on the throne with the power to set the rules for all elections in her kingdom. She has declared that all citizens get one and only one vote, and that the candidate with the most votes wins the crown. This method of voting is most often called first past the post, awkwardly abbreviated as FPTP, or winner take all. The system is simple, fair, and logical, right? Actually, no. It's a terrible, terrible idea. Why? Well, to see the problems with first past the post, let's watch the first election unfold in the animal kingdom. It's an exciting time for the burgeoning democracy, and seven hopeful candidates come forward to run and represent their parties. They put on their best campaigns, citizens head out to the polls, and the votes are counted. The results come as follows. Turtle gets 9% of the vote, monkey gets 18, gorilla gets 19, owl gets 13, leopard gets 20, tiger gets 15, and snake gets 6. Under the rules of first past the post, Leopard is crowned the winner and she gets to rule for the length of her term. 
But take another look at the results, and you'll see the first problem with this system, minority rule. The vast majority of citizens, 80%, wanted someone else's king, but Leopard still won. There were only seven candidates in this race, but if you imagine if there had been 20, she might have only gotten 5% of the vote, but still been elected. This problem of minority rule is only the beginning. The I second problem of first past the post is that, given enough time, it results in an inevitable, unavoidable two-party system. Why? To see, let's watch what happens over several election cycles. Leopard has had her term in office, and it's again election time in the young democracy. And we now, all the citizens of Animal Kingdom, remember the results from last time. This information changes how they behave, particularly snake and turtle voters, who must face the reality that they backed unappealing extremist candidates who don't have a chance of winning. Turtle voters, who were unhappy under Leopard rule, decide to back the candidate who has the best chance of winning, Gorilla. Now, snake voters want to vote for Tiger, who is the candidate they have the most in common with, but they're afraid to because Leopard is running a negative campaign against her competitors. Snake voters, not liking the idea of guerrilla rule, vote strategically for Leopard. The final result looks like this, with Leopard getting 26% of the vote and Gorilla getting 28, making him the new king. Snake and Turtle, seeing their dismal results and knowing the cost of their campaigns, decide to drop out of future races. What started out as a seven-party system is now down to five. Fast forward to the next election. Only five candidates run, and again, the voters remember what happened last time. In this election, it's owl voters who recognize that their candidate cannot win. They are centrist voters and less ideological than the rest of the animal kingdom. As such, they don't really like Gorilla or Leopard. Both Gorilla and Leopard know this, so they each run negative campaigns to capitalize on the fears of the centrists. Owl voters split their vote and are mostly voting against the candidate they dislike rather than supporting the candidate they do like. After this election, Gorilla gets 33% of the vote and Leopard gets 34, making her the winner. Owl, as did Turtle and Snake before her, drops out of the race. In the last election we'll look at, Monkey and Tiger voters are unhappy. They both really like the candidates they have supported, but they now have to compromise. Monkey voters agree with Gorilla on a few issues, but they really don't like Leopard. And Tiger voters agree with Leopard on some issues, but they really don't like Gorilla. They strategically abandon their preferred candidate out of fear of the one they disagree with the most becoming king. The final results are Leopard 49% and Gorilla 51, with him being crowned king. Monkey and Tiger are the last candidates to drop out, and now the animal kingdom is left with a two-party system. Because of the centrist and swayable owl voters, in future elections, Leopard might take the crown, then Gorilla wins it back, only to lose it to Leopard again, but the two parties never change. The citizens of Animal Kingdom ended up with the system, not because they are lazy voters or because that's what they really wanted, but because of the mathematics of how the system is set up. Inevitably, given enough time, all first-past-the-post systems trend towards two main parties. But the choices of the voters still hasn't changed since that first election. Only two-fifths of them wanted either Leopard or Gorilla as their first choice, and three-fifths of them wanted someone else as their first choice. It's this majority of the voters that becomes disinterested in the democratic process because they feel they have no meaningful way to express their real preferences. But it only gets worse from here. If the citizens of Animal Kingdom are divided into groups before they vote, they are susceptible to gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is a bit tricky, but imagine a block of ten homes each with one voter inside. Three are Leopard voters, three are Gorilla voters, and four are Owl voters. If they're divided up into groups before they vote, whoever decides where the lines are drawn has enormous influence over who wins the election. For example, if you group the three leopard voters with the two owl voters, and do the same with the three gorilla voters, you can eliminate owl from the election, even though owl voters have the largest minority and would win under a straight first past the post vote. If the leopard or gorilla parties are in charge when the voting boundaries are drawn, they have enormous incentive to carve out safe seats for themselves. But more on gerrymandering in another video. Bah, I hear you say, vote third party and change the system. This brings us to the final and possibly worst problem of first past the post, the spoiler effect. Imagine now that it's been years and years of guerrilla or leopard rule. Tiger decides it's time to enter the race. He thinks that the voters are tired of the status quo and he has a shot at winning. He sets up his campaign office, gets a surprising amount of gold and donations, and gets on the Animal News Network to debate with the main candidates. Election night comes around, but alas, Tiger gets only 15% of the vote, mostly from Leopard voters who are closest to him on the political spectrum. Gorilla easily beats Leopard and gets to be king. This is the first past the post system at its worst. The better a third party candidate does, the more it hurts its own voters by guaranteeing a loss for the party they most agree with and a win for the party they most disagree with. And don't forget, Gorilla is no fool. He knows how the system works. Where do you think some of those gold donations came from? Meanwhile, the Queen Lioness is displeased. She's been observing the elections and sees that the system is bad for her subjects. And she's been thinking, what makes a good voting system? Well, you should be able to vote for the candidate who you like the most without worrying. More choice in representatives is better. The system shouldn't be susceptible to gerrymandering. And it should be open to new political parties. 
Luckily for the Queen, there are several different voting systems to choose from, including the alternative votes, but that will have to be discussed in detail at another time. Thank you very much for watching. Okay, guys, I'm sending you a poll out in just a second. Let's put it up here so you can see it. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, I'm just going to click on the arrow for a second so that it's going to the bubbles. Okay. So we have other options. We have ranked choice voting, right? You can look at the video there and understand that a little bit more. Um, there are several places where you can see this being used in the United States today. We also have at-large districts where, for example, in Oklahoma, instead of five um, single member districts, you have one big district where people vote for the, and the top five vote getters get it. That's another option. So here you go. We also have jungle primaries, runoffs until there's a majority. We have several states that also do that. Remember, it's a state-by-state -state question, and the slide, the whole slide. So, I just want you guys to look at the electoral map. This is 2016 by county, all right? The deeper red it is, the greater percentage of votes, and we looked at this before when we looked at polarization, goes to the Republican Party, the deeper blue it is, the greater percentage of vote in that county goes to the Democratic County. Uh, if it's paler pink or pale blue, then it's a slight majority. Okay. Here's the congressional map for 2018. It's a little bit different after 2020, but this is a little bit more interesting. And then the 2020 presidential map again some changes, right? County by county. And we see some trends that are changing these, changing the party um, limit, right? We know this about sex. Women are more likely to vote Democratic than men are. But married persons, men and women, are more likely to vote Republican than Democrat. Ethnicity, um, if you are African American, we're talking a 90 to 95 percent vote for from the African American population for the Democratic Party. The Latino community is still a majority, but it's less. Education, people with a college education are more likely to vote for the Democratic Party. People with a high school education or less are more likely to vote for the Republican Party. Age, the older you are, the more likely you are to vote for the Republican Party. The younger you are, the more likely you are to vote for the Democratic Party. But this is what's important. I'm talking about statistics here. I'm talking about trends. I'm not talking about you, Maddie, the voter. Right? You fit into a particular individual that you vote the way that you are drawn to vote, not by your demographics. Demographics matter, statistics matter, because they help us understand how group influences are responding to different political pressures, right? But they do not tell the picture about individuals, and that's something important to remember, okay? I'm not talking about individual vote choice. That's that ideology that we were talking about before. Here I'm talking about kind of mass trends, and that's different. Okay? All right, well, I'm going to let you guys go for today. So until